Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. This is part two of a video on why, on the evidence showing that we're under a global climate change emergency at the moment that is threatening, threatening our very existence on this planet. So I was talking about global biodiversity declining by 50%. That was how I ended up the last video. We're also experiencing massive global cor coral reef bleaching and dying events. And not just coral reefs, but kelp and seagrass beds that all absorb lots of CO2. Um, also mangroves on shorelines um, are, are being decimated by ocean acidification, development, uh, large sea surface temperatures, etc., uh, rising sea level. Um, but also global ocean phytoplankton decline. And this is threatening the entire marine food chain. So Australia, this earlier this year, underwent massive coral bleaching. Not just Australian reefs on the Great Barrier Reef on the northeast uh, of uh, Australia, but also reefs on island atolls around the world and, uh, you know, off other coastlines and things. About 20, at least 25% of all fish in the ocean spend part of their life cycle on coral reefs. So when these coral reefs are, which are, they're biodiversity hotspots in the ocean. When we lose these biodiversity hotspots by bleaching and dying of the coral reefs, what's going to happen to those 25% of the fish? The outlook doesn't look good. I mean, we're looking at a collapse of the, a possible collapse of the entire marine food chain. You know, the, the kelp grow extremely fast, uh, same with seagrass, and capture enormous amounts of CO2 as a result. And we're just losing, losing these uh, ecosystems. The phytoplankton, uh, a few years ago, there was a paper talking about a 40% loss in phytoplankton in the last uh, three decades, four decades or so. Um, some more recent papers indicate, well, maybe the number's not quite so high. Maybe the uh, phytoplankton characteristics are changing, like the color. And since they're detected by satellite, maybe we haven't lost as much. Maybe we're just not detecting as many. So those things are all still being sorted out. But we're definitely losing global ocean phytoplankton because the ocean is becoming warmer. Therefore, it's becoming more stratified. Therefore, there's less vertical mixing. Therefore, the nutrients that are down below do not get up this, to the surface, and those nutrients are absolutely vital, along with the sunlight and CO2 and water at the surface to create for the phytoplankton to bloom and grow. So we know the conditions are becoming much less favorable for phytoplankton on the surface of the ocean. So it, we're, one would expect that they, they decline. This is on, in the oceans. We've also been experiencing massive boreal forest dieback. Amazon rainforest dieback, greatly reducing our global sinks for carbon dioxide. Vast areas of the Amazon are still being burned intentionally so that uh, to clear the forest for plantations, uh, for palm oil, things like that. This has to be stopped. We're getting droughts, repeated droughts, 2005, 2010, 2000 and 12, I think, you know, repeated droughts in the Amazon. So the conditions are becoming less favorable to having forests and trees in the Amazon. The conditions are becoming drier and more favorable to having those forests be weakened and burn. And then the regrowth is more like savanna, grasslands with some trees or even just grasslands, which are, which would take away the Amazon as being a massive carbon sink. Uh, in the, as far as the boreal forests are going, they've been weakened for years by emerald ash borer, by pine beetle, by drought. In fact, an article just came out recently that indicated that California has lost about 70 million trees. Um, you know, most of them more in the more recent, most of them just in the last few years from their ongoing massive uh, widespread drought. So. It's a double whammy when you get these trees 
dying because you, you're getting rid of a large sink of carbon, something that captures carbon, and you're replacing it with something, you know, the, the dead forest, the dead tree matter is broken down by bacteria and produces the CO2 if, it's in the, if, if, if oxygen is present, which it is at the surface. So it's a double whammy. You get rid of the sink and you actually have a, you have a net producer of CO2. Um, not to mention the, for, the fires. I mean, if you're in Fort McMurray, uh, you know, and experience that fire, I mean, it was horrendous. So this is boreal forest uh, burning. We're getting fires. We've got massive fires ongoing right now in Siberia in the peat. So the peat is starting to burn. Um, last year we had massive fires in Indonesia. So we're put, there's huge stresses on the on the uh, forests around the planet. So it's not just the these are the lungs of the planet: the phytoplankton in the oceans, the forests on the land. So yeah, it, it's obvious that we're this is we're we're in trouble. Like this is this is uh, this is uh, this is crazy stuff. Um, I mentioned this: about twenty five percent of the fish in the ocean spend part of their life cycle on coral reefs. What will happen to them as the reefs around the world die? And it's difficult to see when reefs have died. When a reef bleaches. Um, it turns white, it's visible from aircraft, it's easy to spot and map, even from satellite. But after the reef dies, if within a few weeks, you get algae covering the, the skeletal remains of the coral, and then that makes it darker. And then you can't spot these reefs by aircraft or by satellite. So reefs are dying and we're not even able to monitor them, or we might miss them. If, we don't, if we're not monitoring all of them and see the death, then you know, the thing can die, be covered with the algae, and we don't even know that it's uh, no longer a viable reef. Um, massive fires are ongoing in the Amazon, boreal forests, and other northern regions. Like I mentioned, Fort McMurray, simultaneously reducing our carbon sinks and raising our atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. Right, I talked about CO2 levels from July 2016 versus July 2015 being an increase of about five parts per million. This is extremely worrying. Arctic albedo is rapidly declining due to a rapidly decreasing Arctic sea ice and spring snow cover, leading to extremely rapid Arctic warming, or, or known as Arctic temperature amplification. The numbers that are always published are it's two times the Arctic's warming twice as fast, or in some cases, three times. But if you look at vast regions of the Arctic, you know, the high Arctic, it's more like five to eight times faster than the rest of the planet. You know, if the planet is normally warming at about 0.15 degrees Celsius uh, per decade, the Arctic's warming at about a degree per decade, which is a factor of six to seven times faster, just that number alone. And, uh, you know, more recently, the um, planet has been warming at a much faster rate, the global average temperature that I mentioned before. So this is a, the risk of losing all the Arctic sea ice, and I call it a blue ocean event, you know, essentially less than a million square kilometers, on or before 2020 is extremely high. There's no thick ice left in the, Ar in the Arctic. Call it Arctic slushies instead of Arctic sea ice. The, uh, you know, we still have, we still have, uh, you know, a, a, another month of melt in the Arctic, and it depends very much on the conditions of the weather as to how much ice is exported and how much will be left um, this year. But we're heading, the trends are all for exponential loss of, of sea ice. As, as we lose the sea ice and snow cover in the Arctic, the Arctic gets a lot darker. So therefore, the Arctic is warming a lot more. We get the Arctic temperature amplification. And then the temperature gradient to the equator is decreased. So the northern hemisphere jet streams, the polar jet streams, are slowing down zonally and becoming much wavier. So there's increases in the frequency, severity, and duration and in the geographical location of extreme weather events. So weather statistics has changed. Right now, Louisiana is undergoing a so-called one in 500 year event. 
you know, places are getting one in 500 or one in a thousand year rain events, you know, every few years. The statistics of that number, one in a thousand, one in 500, is pretty meaningless. In, in uh, the, the climate is different. The jet streams are becoming much wavier. In fact, the crests went up to the Arctic and brought the Arctic above zero in the middle of winter in December 2015, also in September 2015. The troughs are going so far to the south to the equator that they're actually joining with southern hemisphere jet streams, as I indicated in a very controversial uh, and but viral video that was attacked left, right, and center, but I stand by what I say in terms of these jet streams. It's ongoing work. The melt rates from Greenland and Antarctica ice caps. Okay, so as we get the Arctic amplification, the Arctic's a lot warmer. Of course, green, the melt rates from Greenland are gonna increase. With, so there, the doubling period of melt is under a decade. This is leading to exponentially increasing sea level rise. There's events called the Heinrich events, when huge amounts of ice chunks broke off and from, from glaciers and traveled across the Atlantic. And it's Greenland, a lot of the ice on Greenland is unstable, and there's a region called Melville Bay, which is a good candidate for these Heinrich events. And I'll elaborate on this in, in a future video, but we're we're, we're risking having huge chunks of ice breaking off uh, episodically from Greenland and then going out into the Atlantic and that will significantly increase sea level rise. The globe will experience food shortages soon and simultaneous crop failures occur from extreme weather events um, as they occur during, including droughts and torrential rains. So we're getting stresses on the global food supply. You know, look at Cal the California drought and the price of vegetables and fruits from California. Look at the price of, of grain and wheat crops in, 20, uh, in 2010 when there was massive temperatures in, um, in Russia and they lost 40% of their grain crop and didn't export that year. Look at the vegetables in Europe from massive flooding. Okay, so we just will have these simultaneous events occurring and food prices will spike up. So this list goes on and on and on. The jet streams crossing the equator is only one more piece of an overwhelmingly dire and coherent puzzle. All I'm doing is I'm joining the big picture dots on the present day climate system observations. So there's lots of other things that I haven't even mentioned on this list. Okay, this was just a list I put together quickly in a letter to the Washington Post. It was off the top of my head. There's numerous other things that are occurring. There's stuff happening every week, every day, in fact, in the climate system. It's pretty obvious to me, looking at all of these events, that we've destabilized the climate system. I would encourage every specialized scientist, and scientists by definition are specialized. They're very focused on a particular problem, on a, learning everything about a very narrow, specific, particular problem, and then making an incremental advance in the science on that. I would encourage every climate scientist, in fact, every scientist to drop what they're doing for a week and just study the heck out of the climate system. Look at all the different elements. Look at the elements that you've never thought of before and then try to relate them to what you're studying and then start giving these producing videos like what I'm doing here and let the public know how risky and how dire our situation is and let them know why we, it's absolutely imperative that we declare a climate change emergency now and then we can undergo on an emergency basis the steps of what I call the three-legged bar stool, slashing fossil fuel emissions, as zeroing them as quickly as possible, carbon dioxide removal methods, deploying them to lower CO2 levels in the atmosphere and ocean, and cooling the Arctic so that we don't get enormous warming, melting of Greenland with huge sea level rise, and methane outgassing. So uh, thank you, and uh, like I say, please consider uh, supporting my work. Uh, there's a please donate button on the menu bar. So thank you.